I'm Ethan Schoonover, and this is Hand Her a Sword, instilling confidence in girls through RPGs. This is the recording of a panel from PAX Unplugged in 2018 in Philadelphia, and I'd like to start by saying a quick thank you to my co-panelists, Kate Welch, Satine Phoenix, BJ Hensley, and Dr. Megan Connell. They're amazing people, they're inspiring women, they're a big reason that we see greater inclusivity in the role-playing games community today, and they really bring all of their passion and drive and energy to this panel, which you'll see in a moment. I'd also like to say thank you to Andy A., who is an audience member. He was gracious enough to share his own personal audio recording of this panel with me when he found out that our mixer board recording failed. Uh, Andy, thank you. That really saved the day. A note, I've turned on captions for this video, and I've tried to clean them up, but if you notice uh, any inconsistencies there, uh, please let me know or submit via the YouTube caption, community caption uh, submission tool. And finally, a note regarding language. In the beginning of this panel, I talk about inclusivity, and I used a clumsy phrase, and I knew it was clumsy at the time, but I didn't have a better phrase to hand. Uh, the phrase specifically was girls who identify as non-binary. And I wanted to say a big thank you to Sam and Ollie from the Prism Pals podcast. They came up to me afterwards, and they gave me better words. And the better phrase would have been people assigned female at birth who identify as non-binary. So Sam and Ollie, thank you so much for that. Um, I really appreciate the feedback. And check out the Prism Pals podcast. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, feelings, reach out to me on Twitter, at Ethan Schoonover. I'm always happy to chat. You guys are awesome. <laughs> once more, yes. once more with feelings. guys could come by. Uh, Thanks for stopping. I mean, literally, they ran, so this is awesome. Um, that should instill confidence right there. We're done. <laughs> yes. Uh, so this is Hand Her a Sword. Yeah. Hand, hand her a bottle of water first. <laughs> you may need two. You may actually want to. RPGs teach young girls uh, those important time management skills. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping. You see a hashtag up there, hashtag hand or a sword. If you want to tweet, like, you know, photos or thoughts and feelings about this uh, panel, please feel free to use that as a hashtag. If you search for the hashtag, you will find a post that I've already put up online that has all of our Twitter handles uh, in case you don't know any of us and would like to follow us on Twitter. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I'm going to just get rid of some, some housekeeping stuff here and give everybody a chance to sort of uh, chill for a moment. And I'd like to start by saying that girls, and I, I realize I'm speaking for the panel, so I'd like you guys to jump in with your thoughts, but girls is an inclusive word in this context. Uh, if you identify as a girl, then this panel is for you. And if you are, and this is a, kind of a clumsy way to say this, but if you are a girl who identifies as non-binary or other, this panel is for you. Um, I don't have better words than that, and I apologize for that, but I hope that you sense the intent behind that. Uh, yeah, and allies, right? Because yeah. allies. Yes. Uh, for Sirens of the Realms, it was an all-girl bard band, but now I'm, I, it's all-girl bard band and friends. Like, the whole thing is so inclusive, and we have all these wonderful men and non-binary who want to support all the girls on the show, and it's just like... Uh, <laughs> Jason Charles Miller is an honorary siren. That's awesome. Aww, nice. That's awesome. I, I think that's Satine's way of saying I get to stay to up on the stage. Yeah, we have to have our allies. We have yes. to have our allies. Uh, so let's let's start with you guys. Uh, I, I'd say you're the important ones here, and we want to ask you guys some questions. So I think the how should we do this? Hands, do you think? Or yeah, yeah. Hands. Crab claws. We're in the crab claw theater. <laughs> crab god theater. Uh, are you a woman that has been playing RPGs for more than ten years? Raise your hands. Raise them high. Right on. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask that question in particular because let's have a round of applause for all you. Okay, let's have uh, hands up if you're new to the hobby. You, this is your first con, your first time playing. You're new to the awesome. Welcome. Are you a teen or 
tween? Do we have any teens or tweens here? Yeah! yeah. Or younger, or younger. Do you run games that include girls? I, I kind of want everybody's hands up this one. That's awesome. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Are you, do you, spoiler. Do you run or play in an all-girls game? No. Awesome. Do you run or play in an all-girls game podcast or stream? Renee, I did just meet uh, Renee from Fate the Fable Maidens today, so I put that in for you too. <laughs> awesome. So let's go ahead and meet the panelists. Uh, you know some of the panelists up here, most likely. So we've decided to spice things up and make this the panelists, the hidden secrets episode. <laughs> we'll start with Satine. Do you want to give us a quick bio? I am the community manager for Dungeons and Dragons and the co-creator of Maze Arcana. We do a lot of live streams that are all based on inclusivity. I am the founder of Celebrity Chair D&D slash D20, because we play a lot of games, uh, where we raise money for a childhood literacy program called Reach Out and Read. Comic book artist, actress, model, all the things. Whatever makes my heart happy, that's what I do. <laughs> Amazingly talented. This time for the hidden secret. <laughs> what was Satine's first album? A. Chris Cross. B. Christopher Cross. C. Millie Vanilli. Do 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 do. C. C. Okay, and the answer is. It was a double tape. It was Chris Cross and Millie Vanilli. Over to you. Um, I am the vice president of Lone Wolf Development, the makers of Hero Lab, and the founder of Playground Adventures. Playground Adventures is a company that helps to provide social toolboxes and skills to autistic and ADHD children, and, and really people in general through gaming. We also do educational gaming through Fun and Facts, which teaches children, uh, you know, math and, and reading and a variety of problem-solving things. They learn a lot of puzzles, but they're also doing it uh, while they're playing games, which is cool. Um, I'm an author, an artist, I've done cartography, um, I do some podcasts, I try to avoid those. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I just, uh, like Satine, I think I just kind of hop around and do whatever makes me happy at the time and whatever I can do to help children. I speak in a lot of empowerment panels and that kind of stuff. So I just, I'm a little bit of everywhere all the time. <laughs> awesome. And BJ's first album was A. Hanson, Bop, B. Metallica, or C. R.E.M. I'm going to give you guys five seconds to think. The answer BJ is Metallica! Dr. Megan, over to you. Hello, I'm Dr. Megan Connell. I'm a psychologist and therapeutic dungeon master. I am the GM for Clinical Role, a game where we have all therapeutic du dungeon masters playing. Uh, I am also the co-founder of Geeks Like Us, where we are having professional geeks help mentor and inspire the next generation of geeky creators. Um, and then I also run and uh, host a show called Psychology at the Table that's about how to be more inclusive at your gaming table. Awesome. These women are all way more awesome than I am. Dr. Uh -huh. <laughs> Megan's first album, A, Suzanne Vega, B, Terminator 2, Judgment Day, original motion picture soundtrack, or C, Nine Inch Nails. Terminator. Yeah, Terminator's awfully specific. <laughs> Washington Girls Middle School in Seattle, Washington. I'm the technology director there. Um, I also somehow conned my way into both running a D&D club and actually teaching D&D classes there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't let them know. Um, and uh, other than that, uh, let's see, I'll just, I'm at Ethan Scootover on Twitter. Um, my first album was either Prince, Lori Anderson, or In Excess. I hope it's Prince. Uh, so it was actually all of the above. Uh, but I think Prince was the first one I wore out, so. Um, and Kate, over to you. It's me. Um, hi, I'm Kate. I don't. Is this on? It should be on here. Yeah. No, no, okay. No, okay, now it's on. Hi, I'm Kate. Um, I am a game designer on Dungeons and Dragons. 
I play a character called Rosie B. Stinger on Acquisitions Incorporated, the C team. And um, I have been, I think my qualification to be on this panel is that I have gone and uh, talked to um, Dr. Uh, Mr. S, Dr. S, Mr. E, Mr. E, Mr. Yeah. E, Mr. Yeah. E's classes at um, at Lake Washington Girls Middle School several times, and <laughs> they are incredible. So I, I'm, I guess I'm here to talk about that experience, which has been fun. Oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Uh, okay, we'll do we'll do Kate's first album here. We have either A. Alanis Morissette, yeah, yeah. B. Morris E. or C. Morris Dance Classics. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted so badly to be one of these, specifically. <laughs> I was hoping for C. The actual answer is a lot of yeah. I, I think this is very on brand. I think when you asked me this, by the way, I found out this is the 12th best-selling album of all time. What? Wow. 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 All right. <laughs> Jumping in, girls and RPGs, that's why we're here. Um, just a... Uh, <laughs> This is why I'm here, actually. This is my group uh, that I started in 2017, started with six girls. Um, they're awesome. I, we, I, what, is to, what else is there to say about this shot? We have a table lamp. They're jumping, yeah, we have a headbanger. They're jumping up on chairs. Um, this is from, uh, what did just happen? They had killed something? Like, horrifically? <laughs> but they did it as a group. And uh, this is from the summer. This, uh, Kate actually came to the summer camp, and these are two girls that played bards, and they put together a song and dance routine. Aww. And I'm gonna skip this one just because uh, short of time. And uh, this is today in 2018. Instead of six girls, we now have 26, and three of we have three girls DMing uh, the groups down the line. Uh, it's not, we're not just talking about uh, teens and tweens, although they're super important to me personally, obviously. Uh, these are Dr. Megan. Those, those are my little munchkins. And <laughs> you notice that they actually know how to use their swords and shields. <laughs> <laughs> and I did just get a text from their dad saying he had to take away their swords. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you have to. Sometimes, yeah, to clean their rooms. <laughs> All right, uh, so this brings us to our quest. Chums. <laughs> it, it only goes down from here, folks. Uh, real quick, I wanted to say thank you because uh, we put out a, a, a thread online on Twitter asking for questions. Uh, these fine folks got back to us. Uh, if you are here in the audience, would you raise your hand if you're any one of these people? Oh, dear. Whoa. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't know if that boat's ill. We'll see. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you to all of these folks. Um, we are going to jump into their questions. Here's a picture, though, first of Kate. And Kate, I want to say this is 95 degrees in this room at least, maybe yeah. 100. Yeah. It was super hot. I think you were demonstrating how to choke a foe. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, yeah, I'm giving them the information they crave. <laughs> um, yeah, this was the second time that I came. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Uh, and they, this, what was amazing to me was that this was a, a group of girls who I think were giving up a free period to come hang out, or is, was this summer camp? No, 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 this one was summer camp. Okay. They also did give up a free period. Yeah, yeah. So this was, um, I, I think I was talking to them about a game, game design job at, at Wizards or, or something here. But the, the best part about talking to these girls is that they are so incredibly attentive. They want to know everything. They want to ask me questions. They want to, they're, they're clearly learning actual useful skills. I think you told me you're using it to teach them science and math now. Um, and, they're, and they're so curious and their questions are hilarious because I'll be in there, I'll give them like a five minute talk on being a game designer on D&D. And then one of them will be like, Mr. E has this uh, like cursed ruby. <laughs> and I want to eat it. <laughs> but my, my group mates won't let me. How do I talk them into it? <laughs> I'm probably here giving them advice on how to betray their yeah. teammates. Um, but they're, they're incredible. They're so, they're so cool. They, like they, I, I wish that there could be like a documentary about these girls because they're incredibly inspiring. There's not many, there's like 100 girls in the whole school, is that right? We're at 120 right now. 120, so when you think about that, his, his earlier figure of 26 wow. girls who are participating in, that's like fully a fourth of these, of these girls are all playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. And it's amazing, they, they all, they're all so like self-possessed, 
they're not shy. Like every time I come, they give me these hugs. They don't know me, but they're just, they're so excited to have well, they someone. Know they know you now. They know you now. But they're, I don't know, I, I can't say enough good things about them. And it's clearly that the work that you've done with them has made them into these confident, curious, adventurous young women, really which is so incredible. That's wonderful. Um, I do want to say that they know Kate because Kate and Jeremy also came at one point, and they remember Kate really well, and I have to remind them who Jeremy is. <laughs> so I'm going to jump into the questions and turn off my mic. Back on. Uh, first question I'd like to ask is pretty general and a little broad. What specific benefits for girls can RPG play provide? And I'm just going to turn this right over to you all. Well, uh, so the therapy group I run is all girls, and it's focused on empowerment and helping girls feel empowered through playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And so one of the things that it really teaches them is uh, that their voice matters. That's one of the biggest takeaways that I want girls to have when they come to my gaming table. They want, I want them to feel like what they say matters and what they do matters in the world. And also their, that they have this freedom to say yes and no, and that their no's matter. And it's been such a powerful thing to see these girls take those lessons and also learn how to work together cooperatively. My groups go from ages uh, 13 through about 18, um, though we do have some younger girls in there too. But it's about learning how to work together. And so to not be competitive, but to be cooperative and to engage with one another to get to a shared goal. Um, and the skills and the confidence that these girls have been developing through it is just amazing to see. Um, even my most confident girl in the class, uh, or the group, she um, recently started a Dungeons and Dragons group at her school. And I, I don't, I don't know that she would have done that had she not, you know, started a group at all, had she not gotten the confidence uh, from playing and getting to know these other girls and doing all of this. So it's very cool. Um, I, I think that kind of like what she said, it inspires so much confidence, and it it allows them to form a bond together because one of the things you see in school so very very often especially you know well for all kids but amongst girls is there's a lot of picking at each other because it's what our culture has sort of taught them to do when you create a group and you set them down and they start working together the way they treat each other just changes into something beautiful and you see it not just during the game but outside of the game you know they start to to sort of be their own little band in in school and in sports and, and whatever they're doing I, I've definitely noticed it uh, definitely inspires confidence. Um, I, I think educationally, from an educational perspective, I've noticed that uh, girls start becoming more and more confident about their own intellect even. Like if you're giving them puzzles and they're solving things and they're working through it, they learn to be proud of their talents and they don't hide them. They learn to just let them you know, be and to be who they are and I think that's really important. I'm going to say that um, that voice, that's the most important thing. I don't know if this is right. Um, the voice. It is so interesting how many, and I say women, girls, women, just, you know, you find confidence and then something happens and your voice goes away. And then you find, have to work through it and you find confidence and then all of a sudden something happens and your voice goes away. So that, I just want to triple down on that. Um, you. We, we find our voices through RPGs. More on, just to add something different, exploration of ideas. A safe place to explore your ideas. Maybe it's personal identity. Maybe it's, I have an idea of how I want to act in the real world, but maybe I'll practice that here. And it really creates a safe space so that when you do go out, you're like, it gives you the confidence to be able to be yourself. I also think there's an, uh, this might be somewhat unscientific, but there's also um, a, a confidence that comes from knowing um, knowing a rule set for a yes. thing, yes. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And to know that if someone is, if you get to the opportunity for someone to say like, oh, can do you want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons? You have a, you have this. You're like, oh yeah, I played Dungeons and Dragons. I love it. Let's mm -hmm. talk about it. Um, and to kind of like have those, and, and Dungeons and Dragons is more popular now than it has ever been in its entire history. So having that kind of conversational um, ability with a game like Dungeons and Dragons means that you have something that you can talk to, you know, 10 million people about instantaneously. Yeah, yeah. it goes for girls, it goes for boys, it goes for everybody. But mm -hmm. I think that in particular, young girls have this thing that like they have something that they can relate to people of all ages which I think is kind of rare for young girls. Like yeah. you, across the spectrum of age and, and ethnicity, demographic, this is something that you can 
relate to, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. Yeah, may I expand on that? Yes, okay. So, I, I would like to advocate and address the issue. We don't actually have a question about this up on the slides, but um, whether what the right role playing game is to introduce girls who want to play a role playing game. Um, what would that be? And I, you know, I, when I started my D and D club, it was not D and D club. It was sword, sorcery, and sword, sorcery, and statistics. Um, <laughs> I felt like this was maybe a more palatable uh, title for parents, and also our administration, the, my my fellow administrators in the school, were just more cool with the idea that there were statistics involved. Um, but it, I really thought about what game, and I, I named it that also because I wanted to be flexible. I wasn't sure if I would do D and D right away, and you know, what other systems I should look at. And I feel very strongly at this point that D&D was the right choice for a number of reasons. And chief among those is, I, is the idea of ownership. You know, I, I grew up in the 70s and 80s in rural Wisconsin, which was sort of the birthplace of D&D. I was like the target market for D&D. So it was like totally accessible to me, right? I have a total sense of ownership of this game because of that. Despite the fact that I took like decades off playing, I still have this like weird sense. It's a sense of entitlement. That's what entitlement is, right? And what I'm trying to do is give the girls in my groups a sense of ownership. I want them to walk out the door with ownership of this game. This is now their game. I had a girl who said to me um, in the original club, she said, when, before I started playing D&D, I was really unsure if I would like it. I thought it was just my dad's nerdy game. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, so what about now? And she said, now it's my nerdy game. <laughs> That's it, right? That's, that's the win. And I, I think that if you're, if you're choosing a different system, that's fine, but you just have to understand, like, if you're choosing, like, some, you know, uh, a niche or an indie game, it can be great, but the great thing about D&D is they can walk into a game store or any bookstore now, which is amazing, and they, they can walk over to that section and say, that's my game. Mm -hmm. uh, Target, next. Actually. It's in Target now. It's in Target. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in Target. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to say real briefly, this is uh, one of my original players who had a cleric of the food gods. <laughs> <laughs> this, is also, this is also the girl that Kate mentioned who wanted to put a ru the like, cursed ruby in her mouth. That explains so much. She'll go far. That was yeah, she'll go. <laughs> a grilled cheese sandwich and frying pan. Also, <laughs> also her primary weapon. <laughs> So first session, what are the, here's a question, what are the most important aspects of D&D that should be focused on to make young women feel comfortable in the first session? And maybe we'll, do you want to invert the order here and we'll start with you? Yeah, I have, I have Reverse initiative. <laughs> the, the most obvious one to me and the one that I always tell every beginner is that you can't play wrong. Like, you, you really can't. If you, uh, if you get a rule wrong, it doesn't really matter. If your dungeon master lets you get away with it, then you're playing the game right. That's, 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 that is the rule, the number one rule of D&D. &D, the rule of cool, we call it. Um, and so that's, I think, when I, I, had, I tried to teach my stepkids to play D&D &D and, and they, they took to it pretty well. Um, and they were, but they, they had the same fear of like, what if I do it wrong? I'm not sure what to do. Mm -hmm. When you grow up with video games, which have this rigid code structure, the things that you can do are very tightly gated, right? Um, but in Dungeons and Dragons, the code is imagination. <laughs> Sorry, as it was coming out of my mouth, it sounded so funny. <laughs> um, so it really is, it's boundless. Um, and kids don't grow up with that kind of boundless imagination unless they're invoking it themselves in their own play. But with games, with rules, they're not used to it. So letting them know that there are, there's no wrong way to eat a Reese's is my number one rule. And get excited about it. Yes. Like, I love it when my players roll a one and I make them take damage and I make them tell me how they fail. And they love it. They're like, can I just yeah. choose to fail this? Yeah. And then they come up with some crazy things. Um, the playing with other people. It's easy to play a video game like World of Warcraft or mm -hmm. these MMOs where you're playing against other people or you're playing uh, against the computer and you're kind of wandering listless. Um, but in D&D, people get really stuck on their character sheets and then the fear of failing. But teaching them that you should be responding to the people around you. Like, it's what they do that make you do the next thing. And when you learn how to look at other people in the eye and listen to them and anticipate them and kind of do things for the group, uh, knowing that your value is, like, you are valuable to the group is really important. 
Uh, I think one of the things that I try to establish early on in every game is that it's just okay to be you. Uh, a lot of people, they set a group down of, of people or young women or young girls and they, you know, encourage them to be uh, the Amazon fighter or, you know, Wonder Woman the hero or, and, and I think that sometimes that can be difficult for the girls who are more fashion forward. Uh, you know, it's okay to be a ninja with pink high heels and a mimic handbag that eats everything that comes along. It's okay to be you. And, and I think it's, it's just so crucial that be said and that people remember that because it can be just as easy to alienate somebody's person and who they are in imaginary games as it, as it can be in, in the real world. And that's, that's something that should be remembered. I, I, everything that you guys have said, like that And when you're on the end, it's fun. hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it, just that installation of fun. I, I, want the, I want to see a smile. Like, my personal goal as a dungeon master in every game I run is to instill delight in my players. And so I try to, if I can get that in the first session, a, just a little bit, I, I know I've got them. <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Like, uh, as long as they walk away and have had a blast, they're going to do it a second time, and then you can get into more of the nitty gritty. I mean, like, I'll tell you, like, for the first session for me with new players uh, at the school, I will always just uh, skip most of the rules. Yeah. And yeah. we'll we will fill in usually like the name of their character, um, probably the race of the character, and I won't even have them pick a class. I'll just give them a random background, and it'll be something like, yeah, you were like um, you were a farmer, or you were like a librarian's assistant. Um, you know, you shoveled coal, and they love those, like, weird, and, you know, I really thought they were just, like, throwaway things, but they build immediately elaborate backstories around them, and it also gives them the flexibility to play it out as they wish to, so they could be like, yeah, I was a librarian's assistant, um, but I was dragonborn, and I used to set all the books on fire, <laughs> yeah. um, or, or they can play it like they can play it more feminine, right? And they can so it does like give a them fashion that. designer by day, ninja assassin yeah. by day. And so it, it's there's no expectation on my part like how they want to express that that identity. And I also make it very clear to them that um, they can choose a pronoun if they wish to, and they can also change it later. And I don't ask them gender or their characters just in the first session. I think that's important. Yeah, the moment you start limiting. I've watched it happen over and over. Someone has this idea they've never played before. I had an ex who wanted to be a vampire, and he was so excited. And he told the game master, and the game master said no. Oh, and I he's never played since. Yeah. Oh. yeah, no, you have to be, I think the first session is the most important place to use yes and. Mm -hmm. I really mm -hmm. do. Yeah. yeah. And even you have done, correct me if I'm wrong, I have this memory of the girls telling me that you did like a, at least one session zero where they didn't even have, they didn't have a class at all. Yeah. Like they, they had to earn the class, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I usually do this. This is like, it's actually kind of so mean. But <laughs> I, I made the girls, like in my first group, I was like, you're going to play as level zero. And they'd never played D&D &D before, so they were like, okay. <laughs> and we played like session zero for like, like, or level zero, not session zero, but level zero, right? So like no class, like negative experience points. Like you gotta dig out of this hole, girls. <laughs> <laughs> we did that for like six weeks. Oh my and, gosh. and like six weeks later, they leveled up to level one. And it was like, we had a big ceremony. <laughs> and I gave them, I, yeah, I gave them these like coins, these fantasy coins that, you know, like dwarven writing on them and on this like cool cord with these cool knots in it, and I presented it to them, and they all wear those coins to this day. Aww. Um, but I, I asked them, I said, by the way, just so you know, like normally when you play D&D, start at level one, hope you're not angry. <laughs> How do you feel knowing that I made you play through level zero? And they're like, we loved it. We feel like we really earned our class. Aww. And they also gave them a chance to really pick, like, do they want to do, like, magic or fighting or sneaky uh -huh. or, like, brutal assassin, like some of those. So. What did this level zero games look like? Yeah, like, how did that mechanically work? So, I, it's very rules, basically the rules are super light. I keep, you know, I introduce, like, new rules every time. Um, first session was, like, race class, uh, stats, no modifiers, like, they no, no proficiency, no nothing like that. You get a frying pan, that girl who, had the, who was the food cleric, she started off as a cook. And she had a frying pan. 
And they didn't know, like, do I need a weapon? Do I not need a weapon? I just was like, okay, something bad happened. I introduced uh, peril immediately in the first session. So uh, we had some, like, wolf riders come to town. What's a wolf rider? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, just like, and then they flee the town, and they, they have to, like, they get into a little battle, and they have to, like, improvise weapons or improvise um, solutions. And they often improvise solutions that are nonviolent. Which is another thing about girls, which yes. I find very interesting, yeah. which we will come to. Um, but that's, that's it, and I encourage this just with kids in general, especially um, with the middle school age kids that I've been playing with. Session zero, sessions where you gradually introduce the rules. It eliminates that whole, I mean, these are big books. Well, we used yeah. to do a thing, too. I'm like, looking at Kate. I don't know why I'm looking at you. They Kate. are. Like, what are you? Yeah. We used to do a thing where we would do, basically, uh, creative storytelling. So um, the best way to start, like, little kids, especially into this, is to tell them, like, the choose-your-own-adventure story. It's great for road trips. So you're the DM. So you kind of have to make more of the decisions. But they don't know because they're little kids. So they're like, well, I don't try to do this. And you just have to basically make the decision of how that mm -hmm. goes. And that, too, can get them into sort of finding different character niches and what it is that they're most interested in. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just a picture of my class, the D&D class. This is the first day. They're so awesome. <laughs> OK, uh, Girls Only, is there a need or utility for running a girls only gaming group as pictured? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think there definitely is because um, you just see this when we, you get into mixed gender groups a lot of times where the girls will let the guys just naturally lead. And they will let the guys tell them what they, they're supposed to do and what they should do on each turn. Um, and they tend to be a lot more timid. Whereas if they get that grounding experience of learning the game when they're just around other girls, they start to gain that, like that we were talking about earlier, that voice, that confidence to be able to say, no, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to play. And, you know, I think um, we want to get into, you know, mixed gender groups eventually. But uh, I think for starting, especially with younger girls, to have that all-girl experience can be really powerful. I think that's true, and I think it applies to not only girls, but boys as well. I find that if I run a group of girls and I run a group of boys and I separate them for a while, they have very different play styles, but then they get enough polish and confidence and, and the boys get a little calmer. Um, and then you can kind of mix them together and they're a little bit more accommodating of their own differences. I find that to be really important. Yeah, girls, they're, it's really hard for girls to trust. It's really hard for girls to trust other girls. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, just on a primal level. Yeah. And watching a group of girls bond, and maybe that takes 12 sessions, it's magical. Mm -hmm. Really magical. Yeah. I think it creates something that definitely transcends gaming entirely. Mm -hmm. yes. Something I'll take with them forever. Mm -hmm. So I've never, I've never run an all-girls group. I don't even think I've been in an all-girls group. But when you say... <laughs> When you say that the, the two groups behave very differently when you, when you separate them, yes. can you go into more detail about how they're different? Um, so when you have girls, a lot of times the girls want to save the goblin. They don't want to kill the goblin. They want to make friends with the goblin and take him home and create a little city full of um, all the creatures they've collected along the way as their friends. And I say this because I am that player, uh, but also because many of the girls that I, that I have ran for are the same way. And they, I find that actually, if they're given space where they're not talked over and they're allowed to gain the confidence to speak for themselves, then they will start making decisions, but the decisions they make are different from the boys. I find that when you have a young group of boys and you set them down, it kind of looks like, I kill it! And that's, so, so the boys, you have to sort of encourage them, whether you're encouraging them by giving them experience for making nonviolent decisions. And not all boys are like this, not all girls are the other way. But there is definitely a theme there that happens a lot. And if you work with them individually doing games like um, that are tailored to them, because gaming it gives you the ability to teach people things. It's the best part about it. It's a wonderful tool for teaching. And so the boys, you have to teach them to tone it down a little. But the girls, you generally have to teach them to be more confident. And you have to teach them to go out. And, and sometimes the solution actually is that you have to attack the thing. 
which can sometimes end in people in tears, so you do have to be careful with that too. So there's just different rules. There's different things you have to be careful of. The boys often tend to like the dungeon crawls better, but at the same time, I love a good dungeon crawl, so again, nothing is a constant. But if you give those ones that need work in certain areas that time to build the confidence, to learn how they want to game, to learn what they like, and then you put them together, there's like just this magic thing occurs where they're considerate, and they're kind, and they're like, oh, well, what do you want to do? And then they wait. They wait for the other people. So I know it just seems to work out really well. Well, it's pretty basic. Um, there's the hierarchy of needs, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And once you understand what humans' hierarchy of needs are, women's are different than men. Um, and now we I have- I wasn't brave oh. enough to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I got you, girls, support. Um, but yeah, once you understand, maybe that is something if you're a game master to look into, to understand the players at your table. Of course, experience will change different things. But you, when you have a young girls only group, it is more primal and um, base. It is. Well, and there's just different things they want to do. Like some of them want to go shopping for an hour and a half. And that's a great fun adventure. But, you know, some of the other people at the table might get really over that and just want to be like, well, I kill the shopkeeper, you know. So you just <laughs> create my own drama. No, we need different things. And especially at the younger ages, I think it's important that they have time to develop themselves. Yeah. If, if I can, I want to jump into a little story time here with my group. Um, so I had been running a basically like a Rise of Tiamat uh, storyline where the cult of Tiamat was trying to bring her back to the material plane. And the girls had found out through their adventure that there was a green dragon that was the, the one leading all of this. And eventually, through all of their adventures, they befriended several um, more powerful heroes, and they figured out that the green dragon was uh, hiding in a humanoid form, and they figured out how to corner her and to attack her. And so they developed this very smart plan to take care of her, and they had spent time building allies and gathering their resources. And so they had two very high-level NPC paladins come in and help them because their characters had taken time to build those relationships, and then they also asked. And then when this final fight happened, it was not an easy fight, so I think there were nine, play there were nine characters out on the field. So six of them were the, no, no, seven were the girls, and then two were the NPCs. And they were fighting an adult green dragon. Um, the highest level were two level eights, um, there were, and most everybody else was level three or four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What did like, they do to you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they got to the end of the story faster. But, 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 but what was amazing, though, was because they had these powerful allies in there. That you know, they, it was a little bit even more even of a playing field. And they got to the point, and their rogue actually was the one that got the killing blow by throwing a dagger and hitting the dragon. <laughs> And I was expecting the room to erupt in cheers because this had been uh, nine or 10 months of story that would have been building up to this moment. And they got there and all of the girls burst into tears. Oh, no. They were all crying, but it was a wonderful thing. They cried and they were hugging each other. And one of the girls was finally able to put, I'm gonna cry now, uh, put, put words to what was going on for them. She just looked up, she's like, look what I can do when I'm with my friends. Oh, that is beautiful. Look, and this was a girl who had been horribly bullied at school um, and had like any definition of mean girls of like, I'm gonna be your friend and then I'm gonna get you to tell me all your secrets and I'm gonna tell everybody your secrets had happened to this kid and like, it was the most amazing and powerful thing to see. And just to see these girls connect and to cheer and to just like go, I'm unstoppable when I'm with my friends. When we're what united, we're unstoppable. Yeah. So I just want to mention that I, I read some research about um, girls in schools and obviously something I try to pay attention to where they divided, they, they actually surveyed students and they asked them to identify, you know, popular girls and different, different groupings of girls. And they categorized them as um, popular girls that they were scared of, so mean girls, basically. Mm -hmm. Popular girls who were kind and quiet, shy girls who were kind. So they, they, they had these rough three categories. And they found that the the popular girls, or I shouldn't say that they were kind, but they, they found the popular girls who were not mean shared all the same qualities as uh, girls who were categorized as kind and shy. The only difference was 
that the kind, the popular girls that were nice were kind, that they were, uh, that they were assertive, mm -hmm. okay, that they had assertiveness. So that, sorry, that was a clumsy way of saying this, but the point was is that the popular girls in the school that were not mean had voice, they had assertiveness. And this is one of the things that I think can come out of role playing games. And I, I, believe that, I wouldn't yeah. say that this is based on research, but. No, it's I, my, I've that's seen it. I know I've, she's seen yeah, it. Yeah, I've, I've seen, seen that. Teen has too. Yeah. That is absolutely true. What would your character do? Is a great way to yeah. help you become assertive. Well, not only like that, but like when you when you take like I know you work with a lot of girls who mm -hmm. had struggles and things, and and yeah. being able to help them work through the mental damage that they have and come out on the other side with strength and a voice is, is just phenomenal. Yeah, you know that's and that's that's gaming. Gaming does that. Mm -hmm. Just a shot of a girl drawing on a whiteboard. I'd just like to point out that um, this is a dragon and it likes cheese puffs. <laughs> Lots of whiteboards in our school, lots of doodles during the uh, Game mastering. Any tips for encouraging and helping girls take on the role of game master? And, yeah. yeah. Make it to your end. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I, like uh, I think my, my advice might not be gender specific, but um, my, usually when, when people express concern or nerves about game mastering or dungeon mastering, I assure them that it's very easy. Because it is, it's actually super easy. How many of you have never DM'd or GM'd before? Keep your hands up if it makes you nervous to think about doing it. That's everybody, okay. <laughs> so I was you not too long ago, um, and I was terrified to DM. And then I tried it, and it is so great because you run the show. Like, yes, it is your show. You don't mess up because you're the arbiter of the rules, baby. <laughs> There's nothing that you can mess up. Um, and, and as long as you seek to give the people at your table a good time, as long as that is your primary goal, you're going to be an amazing dungeon master. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's it. I mean, the, the, knowing the rules is helpful, very helpful. Um, and, but, but, but you at don't the, have to. Yeah, at the yeah. end of the day, the rules are yours. And every single instance of Dungeons & Dragons belongs to the group that is playing it. Every single game of DD is different from every other one. So you don't have to worry about cleaving to some absolute correct way to play. Um, and I guess that's, that's exactly what I said earlier about just playing Dungeons and Dragons is that there's no wrong way to do it. But as a dungeon master, it's actually, um, I, I think it might be my favorite thing to do. It's, it's so fun to delight the people at your table. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not really gender specific, but that is my advice. <laughs> I actually like, <laughs> this is so amazing. <laughs> this is my girl. This, this whole thing, like, I'm sorry, like, I can't even believe we're it's 2018. I've been playing since I was eight years old. I've been playing for 30 years. I like had the craziest messed up childhood, and I had like I had D and D from the moment that the crazy started. And I wish there was a group of people, a group of strong women who were there that I could listen to. And like all the stuff that we're all doing is freaking amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just, I'm just like, no. I'm actually writing a book about this whole process, like girl to woman um, uh, player exploring who your character is, becoming the person you are, and then evolving to game master, facilitating delight in people, and making a space, confidence, and making a space for other people. Like that is so important. There was such a small space. There was no space for us, and now we. There's the, the space. It's amazing, and it, the amount of women that you see in gaming today is phenomenal. I've been gaming for for 30 years, a little over 30 years, and it, there was not that. Like like you said, there there wasn't a lot of women. There there was you were taught by a bunch of men or male relatives or old people. I had to force my way into it. Yeah, well, and I, I remember I remember going and being told, no, this isn't for you. You can't. You know, even at game stores, you were kicked out a lot. And now we have this phenomenal, amazing world where women can gym and women can play and, and you look when I walk through the con halls you see so many of us and it's just it's it's phenomenal because I remember like so many times when I was younger feeling like I was the only person who went to the con. In the last five years. In the, it's just these last yeah the last five years has been 
amazing, all, all the new women. And, and it's not like we weren't always there, because we've always been there. We, we really have, but we were mice in the background, afraid to go out and, and be public or be out in the world. I obviously still am sometimes. Um, <laughs> but it takes that one game master. It yeah, takes and that that's one it. woman, one girl to step forward, and then that... It just it's like, gives it's, it's confidence a, it's a to domino everyone else. effect. Yeah, it yeah. just one leads to another, leads to another. Um, as for the question, I actually kind of got distracted. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah, and I, and I think like her, this works for anybody. So all the children at my table that I deal with, anytime they're they're shy about jamming or express interest in jamming, one of the things that they always say is, "It's so hard. You know, I got to remember all the math, and I got to remember this." And I actually encourage them to try it even before they know the game really well. And the one thing I tell them is nobody can see what you're doing behind your screen. I guarantee I can run an entire game without a book, without ever doing any math. It is not actually necessary. You just have to make it look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> run my therapy groups for are amazing because one of the traditions that this group has developed is anytime someone's having a birthday is they host a sleepover for the group and whoever's birthday it is runs a game for everyone and they play their characters that they I play that. in there and so like it's just kind of been this organic thing where they have come to support and celebrate one another and so then they just run games for each other and so like they know I don't from what I gather from them, because like I try to step back too and let them, because it's about empowerment, so it's about them running it and not me yeah. pushing buttons on it. So I just kind of listen a little bit, but you know, it's sounding like they just trust one another that it doesn't matter if they don't know the rules. They just kind of go and have fun. It's like we're gonna go through this tomb and then we're gonna find some stuff or go through the forest. So. We see them on the playground. Like I watch my children go out and obtain other children because I'm like, <laughs> I have six kids, and so they go out on the playground and they're like, we're gonna play this game. And the other kids will be like, how does this work? I'm gonna throw a fireball at you and you have to dodge. <laughs> okay, and off they're going. They're playing D&D &D on the playground. They're LARPing more or less on the playground. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. Next year, LARPing. Yeah, yes. LARPing. we do that, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I just wanna mention like maybe three concrete things that I have come to mind. Uh, I just started running this year, uh, Friday Night Club, 26 girls, and I decided I would have the girls DM. Um, my suggestions are as follows. One, uh, support the girls that are, support who are gonna play as DM. Who, who, if they're gonna be a game master, give them materials. Don't force the materials on them. Don't force them to use the materials, but provide the materials. So I had, again, three DMs. I gave them all the option of running um, some adventures that I provided to them. They could choose from them, or they could choose to make their own. I had one girl who modified an adventure. I had one girl who uh, created the adventure from scratch and threw away everything I gave her. And I had another girl who followed the adventure point for point. So uh, if you're providing those uh, resources, I think it's gonna be kind of a more, an easier on-ramp for them. Uh, the second is kind of gauge their stress level. Uh, DMing can be anxiety producing, and you can get over that, but it can also, sometimes you don't get over it, right? Sometimes it's still like an ongoing anxious moment. And you wanna be there to support that, uh, that student or that uh, teen or tween or girl who's running a, a game and make sure that they feel supported, not alone in that, because being behind the screen can also feel alone. Um, and I would encourage all of you if you, you know, if you have a girl in your life who wants to DM, maybe she hasn't taken that step yet, um, coach her, be a coach. You don't have to DM, you don't have, you You know, you can ask her like, how accessible would you like me to be? Do you want me to be there during the game? Do you want me to be there and talk to you after the game, or before the game? But just be a sounding board if nothing else. And uh, if you can be a coach for that person, I think that's gonna really help to get more girls into being Dungeon Masters. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, moving on. Oh, yeah, this is uh, my original group and I just love the fact that this looks like straight out of the 70s. <laughs> Skull, lamp. They, by the way, I asked them, like, you know, lights on in the classroom, but lights off, they were like, lights off. <laughs> so this is kind of a complicated question, and there's a lot of facets to this. Um, we probably spend the rest of the time talking about it. Aggression. 
How do you encourage uh, cautious or non-aggressive female players to overcome or unlearn those feminine characteristics of what they should do as a girl versus a warrior, or do those girls prefer to lean into what they already know? And I would kind of like also add, like, is that even something we should be concerned about or not? I, I think I'd like to add I that overcome, that, yeah. unlearn those feminine characteristics is incredibly offensive. Right. Yeah. And we should encourage them to use those lean as in. benefits, lean mm -hmm. into them, because so, they are absolutely superpowers I, on I'd their like own. I'd like to advocate for Becca, because I think that she, I mean, she tossed this question up kind of last minute, and I, I, she hasn't had a chance to rephrase it. No, that's, but, that's fair. But I understand um, that complexity to this, so. Well, um, <laughs> make them frustrated. <laughs> but, it's fair. Yeah, it's fair. Um, so I, one of the first things that I ran uh, my girls group through was a very intentionally frustrating wizard's tower, and I stole this idea from Ivan Van Norman, and I told him I did this, <laughs> which uh, you take a game board of shoots and ladders and you have it behind your DM screen and <laughs> And you have to push a button, and sometimes nothing happens, and sometimes a ladder appears, and sometimes the floor opens up and you slide back down. <laughs> and they get very frustrated, and then when they get to the top, they are very angry, and then there's no, they usually will just go and bully the wizard or whatever. <laughs> uh, I, I like it when uh, women lean into their power. You know, like we wield creativity in a way that a lot of people don't understand. <laughs> and um, I encourage it with, this is what they want to do. And then I ask them to elaborate. Like, okay, go further. Like, okay, I just kind of want to go behind and stab. Well, why are you going behind? What, what is it about being quiet? Like, like kind of showing them that they, uh, giving them a voice, showing them that they are more creative and mm -hmm. that it, it can be more interesting to lean into their own personal power. I guess a way that if I were Becca, um, I, I might rephrase this is to, how is maybe, how do you encourage girls to like get out of their comfort zone a little? Uh -huh. um, and that- well, That's a different question. Yeah, yeah I, think, different. I think that's what you're trying to ask here. Um, and I, I think that, that that would be something I would love to hear from you three about, because again, I've, I've the, only, the only way, I've, I've coached a young girl to play D&D before, and it was me just giving her whatever she wanted, which was mm -hmm. super fun for her. She was like, I want to be a unicorn. I'm like, well, it's not a playable... Okay, fine. Actually, I wrote that as a playable <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I will put this into a DVD book in the future just for you. Um, but she, and so I was like, okay, well, you're walking through the woods, and, and she's like, I want to shoot a tree with my magical horn. I'm like, well, unicorns can't... All right, it's fine. <laughs> and so that ended up being my experience of like, she, she's not an aggressive girl normally, but she wanted to aggress, and so I was like, yeah. Sometimes they just need to get that out. You know, that's the one beautiful, wonderful thing about role-playing games is it is a place where you can get all of that out. You know, when you go through your day and all of these things happen, and as women, we bottle it up and we bottle it up because we haven't found our voices or don't want to use them in certain places. And it can be really great just to go kill a bunch of orcs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really helped you. Actually, um... <laughs> So my girls, there's half of them are quiet and half of them are very outgoing. But one of the things that I've been doing is asking them outside of the game, and I actually run a game like a a nonsense. Oh, we're at, we're at lunch or dinner, and we're, let's just run through a no dice like role play oh, yeah, we session. Do that. I love those. And like that's a time for them, especially on stream. It's really hard because there's a lot of pressure of just do it, do it. If we can't figure it out, we'll just move on. Um, this is a way for them to actually look at their character sheet, and we've been, um, for those who are quiet, they're like, actually, what do you think about this? And I created this really cool bladed scarf, has two ends, and she had these really cool ideas, and we were like, um, all right, let's explore that. So by the time we went back to the regular game, she, she felt more confident. She's like, oh yeah? Check this out. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, allowing the shy people to Talk, talk things over and not be put on the spot, I think that is really important. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think sometimes being quiet can just be really important because mm -hmm. a lot of times when you're talking to a shy person or especially little girls, they, they might say, um, well, I'd like to, and whatever that is, but a lot of people will then jump in. If you give them a little bit of silence, 
they'll often expand because they're like, oh, you expect more. So they'll expand and they will create. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get that to happen at the table when you have a bunch of excitable kids. It is, mm -hmm. but one of the things that I recommend, and I think anybody who's seen anything with me in it has probably heard this to death, and I actually am missing my little unicorn today. But if you have a game table with a bunch of kids, you're going to have shy kids, you're going to have noisy kids, you're going to have the kids that go, oh, she wants to do this, you know. Um, I, I implement a speaking stuffed animal. You cannot talk or may take your turn unless you're holding it. So that inspires people to be able to take their turns without that interruption or being told what to do by others. Yeah. I do something, um, whereas in combat I'll often pair them. So they roll, it's two working together and they roll one initiative and then their characters work together. And so I've done that with the more experienced players, with the new players, so they can teach each other. But then it's also really putting that cooperation together. Cooperation is important. You know yeah. what we do? Uh, we invite parents to either leave the table or play familiars. So they don't get full characters, but they get their little cooperation. <laughs> too is like with um, not just the aggression but like it, thinking about that finding a voice you know it, because my games are therapeutic and we're trying to hit on things that are skills for outside of the session I wanted to create things that the girls were going to encounter in real life and so like I made a character who intentionally came in and stole their thunder every time <laughs> oh! yes you know, you know, that makes sense because when we do autistic kids we're actually mm -hmm. teaching social toolboxes so we have to actually make them angry because yep. that's how they learn to control themselves so yeah. this is a little bit different so yeah I this is called the patriarchy yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, it was called Chet <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you glad I came in to save you from that goblin? No, and he would go off and tell all, because he was a hero already. He was a, re he was a retired adventurer. Hashtag not all chats. Not all chats. <laughs> <laughs> he would come in and they would be at the final boss fight. You know, they're down on hit points, they're down on spells, and suddenly here comes Chet in his gleaming armor to step in, behead the final villain, and go, I saved you, be glad. And then he would leave before they could and go tell everybody how he went and rescued them. Oh my god. So, okay. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. We, we only have a few minutes left in this panel, but I think it's very important to me and my career. How did they defeat Chad? <laughs> yes. um, actually, they befriended him and found out why he was the way he was. Oh, that yes. is and Chad was one of the allies they had when they fought the Green Dragon. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Time, but this is such a relatable scenario that I wanted to just bring it up. I am a, this is from Kara Elliott. Kara Elliott 13 on Twitter. I am a girl, but I love playing dudes and non binary characters. And I get a lot of shit from people who, by the way, girls, students watching this, Mystery Just Swore, so. You all, all get inspiration. Yes. <laughs> I'm a girl, but I love playing dudes and non binary characters, and I get a lot of shit from people not in my group about it when I see some of those same guys at other groups playing the, quote, sexy lady elf in a chainmail bikini character uh, point. Uh, I just want to say, guys, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how to handle this. if you make art, if you can make women in proper armor, like, available, <laughs> it is so hard to find I'm sorry, I don't agree. I want a chainmail bikini and furry high heels. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I like ninja stilettos. <laughs> we have we have a pretty strict policy on art. This is a real thing. Um, for fifth edition, this was before I joined the team, but they um, they had a a policy that at least half of the art would be not white dudes. Like they they wanted nice. to. Nice. Yeah. And um, along with that, no boob armor. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no boob windows. Listen, I love a chainmail bikini and fur boots. Yes, a hundred percent. But like, if it's all this boob armor with a with a window of skin right over the vital organs, she not gonna wear that, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that is important to know. Like, there there's a place for these things. Mm -hmm. um, to for this question, 
it doesn't matter what other people think of your character. Mm -hmm. If you want to play full armor, cool. If you want to play bikini, what we're doing at Dungeons and Dragons is setting an example of appropriateness for like the masses, right? We we have to. But we also, we, have, yeah. we want to. We encourage cooperative role play. <laughs> now, if your group wants to do something else, that's your group's decision. If you want to do something else, that is your decision. And you, people should not judge other people and, or their characters that they're playing because it's none of their business. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the best advice I can give this girl is find a new gaming group. <laughs> yeah, uh, because the bottom line is you should be able to play whatever you want to play. I don't care if you want to play a purple, non-binary elf, whatever. I mean, it really doesn't matter. It just doesn't. You can be whatever you want to be, and that should be supported by your friends, You're, and, and you should stand up and tell them that. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We have reached time. Um, let's have a big round of applause for everyone. Talk to us online, hashtag hand or sword. Uh, please feel free to shoot more questions our way. If you use the hashtag, I'll follow it and I'll see if I can get to them, and I, I, maybe other people will too. Yeah. No obligations. I'll do my best. I forget to Twitter. Um, I'll, I'll actually put it on the Dungeon Masters Guide oh, show. That's great.